when the researcher collects data through experiment for example he or she has data of pre and post or there are two groups and the scores from two groups and now he or she wants to know whether the difference between two, two means is significant or not in such cases we must know what kind of statistics are used and how it is proved one way or the other for this we must know what is hypothesis especially what is null hypothesis how it is stated and how it is tested we will also see what is the difference between two means and how to find out its significance what kind of statistics are used first of all the researcher states hypothesis which is called h1 or it is a research hypothesis now in order to test that he or she thinks that it is not true and so tries to prove that what i had said earlier is not true so that means the null hypothesis is set up which says that there is no true difference if the research hypothesis says the difference between pre and post test is positive it is significant the null hypothesis will say there is no true difference in pre and post test scores null hypothesis will say there is no true difference in the scores of control group and experimental group there is no relationship between these two maybe two groups or maybe two readings or maybe two scores this is called null hypothesis and it is denoted by h0 when the researcher states that there is no true difference that means if the difference is found it is by chance otherwise the researcher will confidently say that there is really no true difference if the difference between two means or two scores is significant then the researcher rejects the null hypothesis because the difference is significant so the original null hypothesis which stated there is no true difference it has to be rejected and now we can say with confidence that there is a true difference between the pre and post test between the experimental and control group and we also say that if at all there is a difference it is by chance now we have already seen what is a confidence level or confidence interval generally in statistics we use 95% confidence level or 99% confidence level when we are rejecting a null hypothesis at 95% level we are saying that there may be a 5% chance of this not being true when we are rejecting the null hypothesis at 99% level there is 1% chance of coming it as true but otherwise 99% of the times you will get the same results the research hypothesis h1 which is also called alternate hypothesis must be there because when you reject null hypothesis what you are going to accept what you are going to verify so the researcher must state alternate hypothesis or h1 hypothesis first and then derive null hypothesis from that you cannot start with null hypothesis because when you reject null hypothesis what you are going to accept you are going to accept the original alternate hypothesis that is h1 the null hypothesis is hypothesis which we are trying to reject which we are trying to disprove we are not there to find out whether it is correct we are saying this is to be rejected you cannot accept null hypothesis if your difference or your t ratio or whatever statistic you use shows you the difference is not significant that does not mean that you have to accept you cannot reject the null hypothesis because of this that means whatever you have got may be because of chance so you have to explore it further so what we say we say that in this situation we cannot reject the null hypothesis we have to retain the null hypothesis there must be alternate hypothesis if you reject null hypothesis that that hypothesis is verified if you don't have that that means your experiment is invalid we will see some of the examples of null hypothesis how they are stated there will be no significant relationship between digital fluency and achievement scores of mooc participants this null hypothesis is not 
about the difference, it is about the relationship. So you have to use a different statistic, say for example coefficient of correlation to find out whether this null hypothesis can be rejected or can be retained. Another example, there will be no significant difference between post-test scores of engagement and motivation of high achievers and low achievers. So there are major two groups, one group is high achiever and other group is low achiever. And now the researcher is interested to find out whether they differ on these two criteria. Here the null hypothesis is set up and this the researcher is trying to reject that null hypothesis by using certain kind of a statistics. Now that we have seen what is null hypothesis, we have already said that null hypothesis states that there is no difference, there is no significant difference, there is no true difference between 1 and 2 that is pre and post or control and experimental group. So naturally there are two means, mean of experimental group and mean of control group. So mean 1 and mean 2, you are interested to find out there is a difference, is that difference significant? You may have the same group and you give them pretest and post-test. So you have a pretest mean, you have a post-test mean. So there are two means, you are interested to find out whether the difference in these two means is significant or not. Now there are two types of means, one is independent means or uncorrelated means and there is another group of means which is correlated means. Statistics used for both these groups is different. Let us first see the difference between two uncorrelated or independent means. To give you examples of that, suppose you take two groups, experimental group and control group and give them the test they are uncorrelated because the means which you have are two different sets. If you give them two different tests, that gives you a set of two different scores, that is why they are called uncorrelated means. For the same group, if you give two uncorrelated tests, for example, mathematics and science are correlated, but if you give Marathi and science, these two are, the tests are seemingly uncorrelated. So the kind of data which you get and if you find means, these may be called as two uncorrelated means. If you prepare a matrix, it will look like this because they are uncorrelated. You have population 1, you have population 2 and the mean of 1 is mu 1, mean of population 2 is mu 2, variance is stated by sigma, sigma 1 and sigma 2, that is the population. Now if you come down to sample, you will see sample size is n1 and n2 because you have two different samples, mean x1 and x2 and variance s1 and s2. Now let us see how we can compute and how we can find out whether the difference between two uncorrelated means is significant or not. Please see this formula. We have to find out the standard error of difference. SE of difference is written as SED or sigma D. We already know that standard error of difference is also a type of standard deviation. Standard deviation is generally for sample whereas standard error of difference is the standard deviation of the population means. See the formula, SE of difference between two means that is M1 minus M2 is denoted as square root of standard error of mean 1, we have to take a square of that plus square of standard error of mean 2. You add that and you take a square root which would give you the standard error of difference between two means. Let us take one example. In a study of reading comprehension, a sample of 83 9 standard boys and 95 girls scored as shown below. There were girls 95, their mean was 29.21 and their HD was standard deviation was 11.56. There were 83 boys, their mean was 30.92 and standard deviation was 7.81. We are assuming that this is distributed normally. Would the difference in means be reduced to zero or reversal in favor of girls? Now here we are seeing that the mean score of girls is less than mean score of boys. 
can this be 0 that there is no general difference? This is a null hypothesis that there is no true difference in boys and girls reading comprehension. Now, how do we prove or disapprove this? Let us see. First thing that we must compute AC of difference that is difference between mean 1 and mean 2. N is equal to 95 for girls and 83 for boys. HD for girls is 11.56 and HD for boys is 7.81. If you substitute those values, you will find that AC of difference of means is 1.46. This is the standard error of difference between two means. Now, we have to find out whether actual difference between two means is significant or not. If you remember that was the question. So, what is the difference between two means? The mean for boys was 30.92 and mean for girls was 29.21. So, actual difference is 1.71. For a naked eye, we are seeing that there is a difference 1.71. So, boys are achieving more than girls. Is it because of chance? or is the difference correct or is the difference true that is what we want to establish. So, now we have to find out the critical ratio C r. What is the formula for it? C r is equal to difference upon A c of difference. Difference between means m 1 minus m 2 divided by standard error of difference. Now, we know that the difference between two means is 1.71. And we also know that AC of difference is 1.46. If you substitute the values, you will get critical ratio as 1.17. Now, we must see whether this value 1.17 is significant or not. Then only if it is significant, we reject our null hypothesis. If it is not significant, then we retain our null hypothesis. So, we have to find out whether this value of critical ratio 1.17 17 is significant or not. So, we have to refer to table A in your statistics book. If you see table A, you will find this value 1.17, it is significant at 76 percent. That means, if you conduct such experiment 100 times, only 76 times you will get this result. Otherwise, 24 times you may not get this result. So, chances are more. So, can you reject this null hypothesis at 95 percent level and if not at 95 percent, certainly not at 99 percent level. This can be proved only at 76 percent, which is not an acceptable level of significance. We have already seen that acceptable level of confidence is generally 95 percent or 99 percent. In this example, we have seen that there is a difference in score of boys and girls reading comprehension which is 1.71. This is really not significant because it is not significant at 95 percent level or 99 percent level. So, can we reject the null hypothesis? We cannot reject the null hypothesis, but do we have to accept the null hypothesis? No, we have already seen that null hypothesis can only be disproved, it can only be rejected we have to retain this null hypothesis. We may have got this results because of many reasons. We have to explore that. We may conduct the experiment again. We may enlarge the size of the sample. Many things can be done. We can do it again. But at this point of time, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. We have to retain it. When we see the difference between two means and we are interested to find out whether it is significant or not significant, we also must know one more thing that is whether our distribution is one tailed or two tailed. Now, what is two tailed and what is one tailed? Let us see that. Under null hypothesis, if the distribution is normally distributed mean 1 minus mean 2, it can be on positive side or it can be on negative side. So, this is two tailed. Both the tails, both the extremes are in the distribution and we are interested. The researcher is interested to find out the difference either on positive side or on negative side. This is called two tailed test of significance. When the primary concern of the researcher is that of gain. For example, if you are giving them some kind of input that is independent variable, a program for reading comprehension. If you do this for two, three months, you are sure that either it will increase, but it will not go down. 
because you are giving additional inputs, you are not interested whether it is decreasing because you are sure that reading comprehension is not going to decrease or we are not really concerned about that. It is not important for the researcher the other end. So we are only concerned about one end that is say gain. Sometimes it is other end which is negative. So we want to reduce the anxiety. We say we are only interested in reducing the anxiety, not increasing the anxiety. So whatever program which we will be using is not going to increase that anxiety. So we are interested only in reduction of the scores of the mean. In these two cases, the researcher is interested only in one side of the distribution. So this is called one-tailed significance test. The example shown on the screen will give you an idea what is one-tailed and what is two-tailed. In this figure one, you are seeing that only a part on the right hand side is shown colored. That means the researcher is interested only in one tailed significance test. Whereas in figure 2, both the ends are equally important for the researcher. Let us take one example. The researcher was interested in improving reading comprehension. So he used one particular strategy. Now this was used with the experimental group. There was a control group which did not get any of these inputs. Now at the end of the program, it was found that the difference in control and experimental group is 5 and the standard error of difference is 3. Now there is a gain, gain of 5 points. Is this gain significant? That is a question. How do we answer this question? What is given here? M1 minus M2 is 5. AC of difference is 3 and we have to calculate critical ratio that is D upon AC of D that is difference between two means upon AC of difference between two means. So we have 5 by 3 that is 1.67. Now critical ratio is 1.67 we have to find out is it significant. We must see the table D in your statistics book that gives you the probability of significance. Our critical ratio value is 1.67. If you see that, at what level it is significant? From table D we find that 10% of the cases in normal distribution lie to the left and right of 1.65 sigma. This 10% is on both sides. That means one side if you take one tailed distribution, because we are only interested in gain, we are not interested in the other end. So instead of using two tailed analysis, we will be using one tailed analysis. So when we are given 10% of the cases, we are only interested in 5% cases. That means this 1.65 sigma is true for 5% cases, that is 95% confidence level. So we are only interested in cases in the right hand side, only in one part. So we are using one tailed analysis and it gives us a confidence that only 5% cases by chance, otherwise 95% confidence level can be achieved because of the CR value which is 1.67. In this case, if you have taken two tailed analysis, instead of one tailed because the researcher is only interested in gain, that means he or she has to only select one tailed analysis. If you had selected two tailed then you would not say it is a significant difference, the critical ratio is not significant and you would not be rejecting the null hypothesis. But now you see because it is one tailed, you can confidently reject the null hypothesis at 95% confidence level. The null hypothesis which stated that there is no true difference in control group and experimental group on their reading comprehension has to be rejected. Now this difference of 5 points is significant difference that means the strategy which was used by researcher is proved effective. When we make inferences from the critical ratio or any other statistics, we have to be extra careful because the researcher tends to make two types of errors in inferences. One is type 1 error and other is type 2 error. What is type 1 error? When we reject the null hypothesis thinking that the difference is significant but in actuality it is not significant. Actually there is no true difference exists but we reject that null hypothesis saying that there is a difference. 
this is type 1 and type 2 is exactly opposite of it. It is not rejecting or retaining the null hypothesis when actually the difference is significant. Both these create problems with your findings. You have to be extra careful because the experiments which you are conducting, especially in social sciences, they do have its impact on a larger public. So, we have to be extra careful in inferencing from the findings what we have, from the statistics which we use. Now, how to avoid these errors? Because these are the errors. Now, can we avoid these? Let us take type 1. Type 1 error is saying that the difference is significant when it is not so significant. So, if you are taking significance at say 90 percent level, how to avoid this? You can increase the level from 90 percent to 99 percent. Keep it to the highest, so this error may not come in. But if you put this higher level, then there is a possibility of type 2 error cropping in. That is actually it is not significant and you are saying it is significant. If you take care of type 1 error, there is a danger for falling for type 2 error. That means, you are retaining the null hypothesis thinking that it is not significant, actually it is a significant difference. So, the researcher has to decide how he or she would like to compromise, whether he or she would go for type 1 error or type 2 error. Generally, type 2 error is not given so much of importance, but type 1 error is very important and we should try to avoid it as much as possible. We have been discussing about the significance difference between two means when the means were uncorrelated or independent. Now, there is another set of means which are correlated. So, let us see how the difference between correlated means is found to be significant or not significant. There can be two, three situations because we use different designs of experiments. The first type is single group method. In a single group method, we give pre-test and post-test. Generally, it is the same test which is given before the experiment begins and it is given after the experiment concludes. So, the means are correlated because they are on the same test. Now, how to find out the ACO of difference between these two means? There is a formula, please see it here. AC of difference that is AC of mean 1 minus mean 2 is given by square root of standard error square of mean 1 plus standard error square of mean 2 minus 2 into r of 1 and 2. r means coefficient of correlation between two means multiplied by standard error of mean 1 and standard error of mean 2. This formula we use because these two means are correlated. So, we find out the correlation between two means and we use them in this formula. Let us see one example. The researcher is interested in improving reading comprehension of a group of children. Now, the same group of children are worked with. So, they are given initial test and they are given final test. There are 64 children. So, number of children for initial test and final test are same 64. The mean score for initial test was 45. The mean score for final test was 50. The standard deviation of initial test is 6. Standard deviation of final test is 5 and we know how to compute standard error of the mean. Standard error of initial test is 0 0.75. Standard error of final test is 0.63. Now, there is a difference in the mean that is 5. It is raised from 45 to 50. So, the difference is 5 scores. Now, if you find out the correlation between these two because you have a set of 64 scores for final test, you have a 64 scores for initial test. If you find out the correlation, you got the correlation as 0 0.60. Now, you have to find out whether this 5 score increase by score gain from pre-test to post-test is significant or not. So, difference between means is there 5, but only by seeing 5 is not enough. We have to say whether this difference is significant and for that we have to find out first AC of difference, standard error of difference between two means. Use the same formula which is given here. Let us substitute the values in this formula and we get 
the AC of difference as 0.63. Now, if you have to find out the critical ratio, critical ratio formula, you know that D upon AC of D. That is difference between two means divided by AC of difference between two means. So, we have the values 5 upon 0.63. This comes to about 7.9. So, critical ratio is 7.9. Now, we have to see whether this critical ratio is significant or not. How do we see that? We use table D. In table D, the first column is of degrees of freedom. Now, we know that we have to find out degrees of freedom. How many scores are there? 64. So, what is the degrees of freedom? N minus 1. So, degrees of freedom is 63. So, in the first column, if you see degrees of freedom 63 and find out what is the probability for 0.95 or 0.99 level, you will see that for 63 df, T ratio value is 2.39 at 0.02 level. Why do I have to see 0.02 level? This is given for both, but we are not interested on two tailed. We are interested only in gains. That means we are interested in one tail statistics. So, though it is given for 0 0.02, for us it is 0 0.01. Now, for 0 0.01 level, that means 99 percent confidence level, the critical ratio should be 2.39, whereas the obtained value of critical ratio in our experiment is 7.9 which is far more higher than the expected value of critical ratio to be significant at 0 0.01 level. That means, our difference of 5 point is significant and we reject the null hypothesis at 0 0.01 level. That means, with 99 percent confidence. What was the null hypothesis? Null hypothesis was there will be no significant difference in the initial and final test on reading comprehension. So, now we are rejecting this null hypothesis and we are saying the difference in initial test and final test is significant. That means, whatever we provided as independent variable or treatment has proved effective because it increased the score from initial test to final test. We have seen this formula for single group method. Similarly, there would be other situations if you select different designs. For example, you may select a design of equivalent groups. In equivalent groups, you may have matched the pairs. You know that how to match the pairs. So, that will also give you two correlated means because there are two groups which are matched. There will be another situation with another experimental design that the two groups are matched on their means and SDs standard deviations. So, you will have two correlated means and for that you have to use an appropriate formula to find out whether the difference between these two correlated means is significant or not. That will give you a confidence of rejecting the null hypothesis and saying that the alternate hypothesis which you had stated earlier is true. Thank you.